Good morning, Oregon, and thank you once again for loading me down and queuing me up. I'm Finn J. D. and I'm bringing you another daily episode of the Offbeat Oregon History Audio Edition podcast, which every weekday brings you another story from the archives of the Offbeat Oregon History syndicated newspaper column. Full details are at offbeatoregon.com. Check it out. But first, sit back and relax and let me tell you the story of the world's biggest log cabin, which was lost in a spectacular spectacular 1964 structure fire. Some defective vintage 1905 electrical wiring had lit off Portland's legendary forestry building, a structure made of massive, flawless, old-growth logs that had been built for the Lewis and Clark Exposition in 1905. It was utterly irreplaceable and a real tragedy, but for those who were there and got to watch it burn, really quite an amazing scene. It's brand new on the website. I just posted it this morning under the headline, Oregon Lost World's Biggest Log Cabin in Spectacular 1964 Fire. Here we go. When the sun came up on the morning of August 17, 1964, Oregon was home of the world's largest log cabin. When the sun went down that evening, it wasn't and firefighters were still battling a blaze that sent flames ten stories into the air and rained burning embers the size of apples down on neighboring houses' roofs. It was the granddaddy of all fires in this historic area of Portland, local photographer and graphic designer Grant Kelton later wrote. I don't think I'll ever see anything like it again. The cabin was the last surviving building from the 1905 Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland and it sat across the road from Montgomery Park in the northwest section of town. It was an enormous structure, measuring 206 by 102 feet, just shy of half an acre. A full million board feet of lumber went into it. Portland timber magnate Simon Benson, the fellow who installed the famous Benson Bubbler drinking fountains in downtown Portland, supplied most of the logs for the structure, and they were hand-picked old-growth monsters from Columbia County. There was a colonnade down the middle of the building made of 52 unpeeled, six-foot-thick tree trunks, hand-matched like a string of pearls. They'd had to be handled specially when they were cut and hauled to preserve the bark. After the 1905 exposition, the building was purchased by the city of Portland, which for many years let it decline and decay. It was nearly lost to fire several times when embers fell on the roof either from nearby building fires or from wood stove embers, but quick responses by the fire department kept it going. In the 1940s, there was talk of actually demolishing the building, which by then had turned into a safety hazard. The balconies had been built with whole logs, which had warped, making them dangerous, and the whole building was like a banquet hall for wood-destroying organisms like bark beetles and termites. Finally, in the 1950s, the Chamber of Commerce took up a collection to restore the place. By this time, people were starting to realize that it was completely irreplaceable. Old-growth timber like what had gone into its construction could still be found, but it was deeper in the forest and less uniform. Finding 52 matching trees would be prohibitively expensive, if not impossible, to do. And since the logs would have to be trucked to the site rather than just floated up the river, log handling systems would have to be engineered to prevent the bark from being scarred by the logging equipment. By the time of the state sesquicentennial celebration in 1959, the building was mostly restored to its former glory. It now boasted a, quote, priceless collection of logging and lumbering exhibits, both antique and modern, according to an Oregonian report. Also on display was another bit of history, the first sheet of commercially produced Douglas fir plywood ever made, a product of the Autzen family's Portland Manufacturing Company, produced in 1904. All of this went up in flames on what was surely the biggest and most spectacular single building structure fire in Portland history, and until the 1992 burning of the blimp hangar in Tillamook in Oregon history as well. On August 17, 1964, the forestry building's caretaker locked up for the night at about 5.30. Within 45 minutes, neighbors were noticing that something was wrong. 
Specifically, the place was on fire. And when the fire crews arrived at around 6.15, it was clear that nothing short of direct divine intervention was going to put it out. Quote, There was never a hope of saving the building, the Oregonian reported the next day. Nothing was saved from the inside. It turned out that the fire had been started by some bad vintage 1905 electrical wiring. Had it broken out an hour or so earlier, the caretaker might have seen it in time to raise the alarm and possibly save the building. But that's not what happened. The fire rapidly grew to spectacular proportions, and people flocked to the scene from all over Portland. Grant Kelton was a boy at the time, living about four blocks from the building. The flames were almost ten stories high. The fire illuminated the sky for miles. The neighborhood was an orange glow, he wrote on his website. The windows on the entire south side of the Montgomery Park building were blown out. The heat was so intense the windows were popping out. Glass was raining down to the street below. Ashes the size of large snowflakes fell to the ground within a mile of the structure. It was surreal, an amazing sight. Some of the spectators, the Oregonian reported, were in tears. Afterward, the city pulled itself together as best it could. Citizens and civic leaders got together with timber industry leaders to create the Western Forestry Institute to fill the void. The new institute soon had a new building, roughly the same size as the old one, in Washington Park, and generations of Northwest Oregon school children remember it from field trips to, quote, the Zoo, OMSI, and Forestry Center, before OMSI, that is, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, moved to its present location down by the river where the submarine is. So yes, they replaced what the building did, and we can be grateful for that. But they could never replace what the building was. What the building was was the cream of the Oregon timber crop in 1905 at the peak of an era when Oregon's timber was the finest and biggest and most amazing in the world, and there just isn't anything like it anymore, and there never will be. At least not for another 600 years or so, where we can grow another old-growth forest. Well, that's it for today. So if you're listening for the first time and want more information about Offbeat Oregon history, you can get everything at our central website at offbeatoregon.com. You'll find there the complete catalog of about 185 columns going back to 2008, plus links out to audio and text feeds on RSS and iTunes, and to the Facebook page and Twitter feed in case you'd like to join the conversation. The website's also where you'll find full citations to sources for this story, which include Mark Moore's website at pdxhistory.com, Grant Keltner's website at grantkeltner.com, worldforestry.org, and a book by James Andrew Long. Our theme music is a track titled Old Man's Waltz by the Atlas String Band, atlasstringband.com, written by Carmen Ficara. Coming to Corvallis, drop me a line. Let's grab a cup of coffee and talk history. I'm at finn at offbeatoregon.com, or if you do Twitter, at offbeatoregon. This podcast is covered under a Creative Commons license. For details, see offbeatoregon.com slash cc. Well, that's it for today and for the weekend. Our next episode will post on Monday when I'll tell you about the remains of a backwoods luxury spa at Will Hoyt Springs County Park. During the heyday of hydrotherapy, the remote mountainside resort was Clackamas County's number one tourist draw. And its waters actually had scientifically provable therapeutic value. I love this article because I lived, actually, when I was a very young child, about mm, three miles away from Will Hoyt Springs basically a field with a spring in the middle of it. Well, look for that after about 6 a.m. Monday morning. In the meantime, go fill up the rest of the day with good stuff. Bye now. Bye now.